It's impossible for the common man, let alone a trained expert in cosmic examination, to comprehend how far from our solar system we set out to travel that day. Have you ever tried to think about how large the number infinity is? You could literally pick any number, put 10,000 zeros on the back of it, and still be infinitely small compared to any number after that. Now. If I'm still making sense, imagine infinity except in terms of distance. As far as we know, there is no end to space. You could fly until time ended, and even after, and still never reach the end. I, being a veteran of the Intergalactic Exploration Association, will never be able to fully wrap my head around the concept, and it's most likely that no mortal ever will. But it is necessary that you try to understand the significance of what we stumbled upon years and years ago in the vast expanse of nothingness. I don't know what year you all, if anyone, will be reading this in due to the confusing properties of general relativity. I'm going to assume that you all are living in the late 2000s, but I guess it's hard to be sure. What I can tell you is that despite what you might know about the hardships of the mid-2000s, humanity actually got its shit together and decided to clean up the earth, stop the majority of the conflicts, and focus on science and technology. An area deemed the Second Renaissance pulled us off the brink of the total decimation of earth and into a new time where humanity instead focused on the exploration of what was then called the next big step of mankind. The year was 3032. At this point, the Moon, as well as Mars, Venus, and Pluto, all had colonies of varying size on each of them, with the biggest settlement on Pluto, with a population of 200,000. I was in my fifth year in the second division of the IEA, and was stationed on our research stations on Pluto. Basically, humanity was starting to size up the rest of the galaxy around us, and wonder what was really out there. Considering all we really had were telescopic images and a few low-resolution photos some drones had taken. A few months after my promotion to third-class traveler, I got the call that I had been vetted and was offered a position on the voyage Inquiry 2.0. I asked what had happened to Inquiry 1, and they told me it had unfortunately imploded on launch, and its passengers launched into space with no way of returning to humanity. Anyway. I guess it makes sense in hindsight that they chose me. I have no close family or friends, and had a vast amount of information about whatever we already did know about travel in outer space. I was brought to a briefing room a few days later with several others who I had never seen before. It was this day where we learned of the voyage's true purpose. Several months earlier, the IEA picked up what sounded like possible sentient communication from a source around two light years away. That might seem like a lot considering that it's around 12 trillion miles, but it was far closer than any scenario of alien life we could have imagined. We were told that due to how close the source is, the IEA decided it would be best to go ahead and send up a small crew of around 50 men and women to investigate. As they progressed into the next part, it was further revealed to me why they had chosen someone of my background for this expedition. Although we had made bounds in the speed in which our ships could travel, even our most cutting edge ones couldn't move much past 235 million miles per hour. This is incredibly fast, but nonetheless means that our journey could last upwards of 13 or 14 years. For the average non-space explorer, this is a non-negotiable deal breaker and turn all but the most dedicated away. But fortunately for me, I did not have any of the strong emotional bonds that would have had a firm hold over almost anyone that was considered for this journey. We were told that this would be a great duty not only for our planet and sector, but for all humanity. And if the trip was successful, we would probably live out the rest of our lives in a cloud of honor. Some people, after hearing how long the expedition would take, simply thanked the presenter for the opportunity, but ultimately refused and left. Understandably. 
Yet most of us stayed, thinking about what has to have been a once in a lifetime opportunity. Phase two is what was called the second stage of preparation for our lengthy excursion. And we were told all of the ins and outs of what we would be doing out there. I had to take grueling classes on many topics. One was engineering, specifically for our vessel. Others cultivated very specific yet crucial skills, such as our psychological well-being in small spaces for extended time class, or our containment of unknown pathogens class. Others carried darker implications. Such classes taught us the signs of irreversible psychosis, how to properly burn or cremate a body in low oxygen environments, or how and when to completely self-destruct our ship. As I was taking each of these courses, the full weight of what me and 49 other people were about to do was finally starting to sink in. Stage 3 of the pre-departure phase took place two years after I first found out I was to be a part of this expedition. We all lined up what little we had in each of our own personal lives such as pets, jobs, and most importantly, our will. Even though most of us had no close family or friends, there was still a feeling of creeping anxiety and sorrow for what we would be leaving behind. Our ship was massive, capable of holding well over our 100-man crew comfortably, and had as many recreational rooms as it did research rooms. I guess it had to be that way to keep us from going crazy. Anyway, by this time all of us knew every corner this ship had to offer. Most of the upper half contained the navigational controls radio communication, meeting room, all the essentials. Then defense rooms lined the perimeter of the rest of the ship. In these, you could find supports that would withstand a ridiculous amount of pressure, as well as weapons, armor, jetpacks, and so on. While it's most likely that we would rarely go into these places, we were going further into space than anyone has ever gone, and therefore had to be prepared for whatever possible. Eight landers were fitted onto the bottom of the ship, so we could land and fly back up from a planet. Towards the center of the ship contained all of our recreational and entertainment rooms. Some of the rooms we had were a gym, a soccer field, a movie theater, and so on. In fact, our ship was so massive that we even had an artificial field with small hills and a pond. Also, did I mention that half the crew composed of girls and the other half of boys? The point is, we were as well prepared as we could be for a 14-year journey. After a few more days of last-minute training and tests, we were all given a few days to relax, enjoy the last few moments we had on Pluto for the next 14 years. To be completely honest, I found Pluto to be a little dull. The only place interesting enough to live a lifetime was Earth. And sometimes, I regretted my decision to move to Pluto. I was tired of it and spent the last day I had thinking about everything ahead of me in a bar. In single file, we entered the ship one by one. I was toward the back of the line. As I neared the entrance, I slowed and glanced back one last time at the unfiltered scene behind me. All I can recall was the stone-cold agents who had organized the voyage. They weren't smiling. I turned back and entered the dimly lit room and took a seat. Strapped down, the timer neared one. No one was talking. In fact, it was completely silent. Despite how large the ship was and how much the electronics and machinery had to do every second, you would think there would be some noise. But actually, we learned during our training that each of the walls between the rooms were extremely well soundproofed for a multitude of reasons. Something to do with people hearing whispers through the walls that they weren't able to discern from reality after extended periods aboard previous vessels. As we took off, all we could do was feel the g-forces, look down on our home we were leaving, and listen to the subtle rumbling of the ship. Anyway, quite a long introduction to the scenario I found myself in all those years ago, but it's important for you to understand what we went through. Although we had gone through years of training, we had little idea what was out there, and had taken a great risk to be here. Skip to day 60. All going well so far. Baxter, one of our navigators, was becoming a good acquaintance of mine. After all, being another one of the lead navigational experts, 
it would make sense that I would spend a lot of time with the others in the same field. In a way, it felt strange. I hadn't had any good friends of mine for my entire life of 34 years so far, and somehow in 60 days into the voyage, I already had someone I considered a friend. Our five-hour shifts in the navigational center became something I always looked forward to. Baxter was someone I looked up to as well. He fought in one of the few battles humanity has had post-2050, involving Russia and the US, taking place in Upper Syria. I didn't really understand the whole thing, but apparently, there had been some kind of quarrel between some newfound resources over there, and the next thing he knew, his squad was starting to take fire at one of the desert metal factories the US was in control over. Over the next two days, 29 US soldiers and over 40 on the Russian side had been killed. I tell you this because it's a rarity to meet someone who has been in a real battle at this point, much less one between the US and Russia. Despite high tensions in the ensuing months after the incident, no one really wanted to start a war. And very slowly, but surely, tensions started to die down. Baxter had also been a part of one of the biggest mass grave exhumations of the 3000s involving 40 lost explorers on the north edge of Mars. To keep a long story short, the team was underprepared traversing the beyond freezing temperatures of the poles, which sometimes gets down to minus 125 degrees Celsius. Four months later, Baxter's team made their way to their last known location. I won't go into any of the details, but according to him, despite the lack of bacteria. The bodies were surprisingly hard to identify due to significant exposure to the elements. This led him to telling me all about the forensic science he knew, which was of great interest to me. Year two. At this point, Baxter and I were good friends. I can't remember exactly when, but we eventually joined one of the small basketball teams the ship had. It was a nice contrast to the mindless gym hours we were required to fulfill to keep our mental health in check. Even after being on the ship for around two years at this point, I was finding more and more things to do every week. Year 5 Still, five years into our journey and I was feeling better than I had in my entire life. Baxter and I had really increased our basketball skills and had become seasoned movie critics. Even though our ship was slightly larger than that of a college campus, one would still think they would long for freedom after years of spending every day in it. But those feelings hadn't come yet. One evening shortly after the anniversary of our launch day, Baxter and I, along with several other navigational experts, reported to the navigation room for our nightly shift. It was during these times where we made sure everything was on track as well as monitor any changes in our surroundings as we traverse the unknown toward our destination. I guess I didn't mention that, did I? Although the IEA knew the general location of origin in the galaxy the abnormal signals came from, they weren't sure if any planets or other objects were around. We were told that if we did find a planet big enough, we were to first observe it from afar to see if the source of the signal was coming from the planet. Next, depending on if it did or not, we were to then start setting up a small research station on the planet, or in the case of us suspecting the sounds did in fact come from the planet, stay on the ship and conduct as much research on whatever it was until we were sure it was safe to land on the planet. Anyway, I digress. On this particular shift, I decided to look further into our projected course and see if I could begin to make a visualization of what we could expect to see in the next few months. We used various techniques for this, including using telescopes, heat signatures, chemistry, and statistical inference. These techniques are much too complicated to explain and go way past the scope of this story, but the point is that, at most, we could predict if we would see planets and other objects months in advance. On this particular evening, however, as I was just starting to scan the screen and make some calculations, I noticed an anomaly there were less planets than there should be. Not as though we knew exactly how many planets were going to be in a certain area of space, but the IEA had compiled data on the concentration of planets for hundreds of years. According to the data we had, there were less planets than we should be seeing. 
but it didn't take a statistician to know that there was an unnatural amount of planets missing from the expanse ahead of us. According to the program, in about two weeks' time, we would run into something we then called the drop-off, where we would go from approximately 100 planets per 100,000 miles cubed to less than one. I double-checked, no, triple-checked the system. Same result. I motioned Baxter over a few moments later and told him to take a look. The Ducibus was already alerted, and the meeting was called shortly thereafter. For anyone that doesn't know, the Ducibus were a group of seven people that were what you would call the decision makers. Any big decisions or calls would ultimately be up to them to decide. These guys were veterans of the IEA and had vast knowledge of anything related to space travel you could think of. Safe to say that when these guys called for a meeting, shit was serious. The meeting was held in the conference area directly under the navigational bridge, where Baxter and I spent most of our time, considering navigation was our specialties. In the center of the conference room sat a table, in which me, Baxter, and around 20 other skilled workers of various specialties sat. At the opposite end of the table, the Ducibus sat. We told them everything we had seen, and if we had any recommendations, which at the time, we had none. The danger in this so-called drop-off lies in several things. Space vessels this far away from Earth and familiar marks basically map our position and the direction we are traveling by constantly marking other stars and planets around us. While very reliable, it isn't perfect, and a failure of this system could leave us in the dead expanse of nothingness with no clue on how to get out. Another danger we considered was if there was some sort of hazard or force that was the reason planets didn't exist in that area, and in turn, would harm us and our ship as well. Even though all of our lives could be put in danger, there wasn't much debate on what our next point of action would be. Extra navigational points of reference would be set up before the drop-off. Our center of navigation would also be checked for any bugs or issues with the software. Then we would push on. While I found it alarming that the drop-off even existed, the thought of never being able to find our way back home wasn't our biggest worry. The fear of turning around and coming back to our solar system empty-handed after five years of travel scared me more than dying at that point. Most people felt the same. Year 7 under normal circumstances, traveling for years in a ship where the only thing you could see outside your window was the pitch blackness of space would drive anyone into madness. But because of the enormity of the vessel we were traveling in, along with the amount of people on board it, things were going better than expected. In fact, the only difference for the past several months was constant work in the navigational center, making sure all of our systems were running clearly. Still. There was an air of uncertainty that encapsulated all of us. We knew we were close. As the months winded down into weeks, a dot popped up on the navigation screen. We knew what it was. We were projected to be within orbiting range of what we named Planet ISO in around three and a half weeks. Using a built-in telescope on board the ship, we could tell the planet seemed barren. It actually almost perfectly resembled Earth's moon except about 10 times bigger and with less craters. Conveniently, another small star sat close enough to it so the surface was constantly lit. Nothing else about it stood out. We figured we would most likely be looking for something on the other side of it, or maybe even under the surface. The signal was still getting stronger. At this point, it was still impossible to make out what it was, but waves of low rattling pitch reverberated through the speaker almost sounding like something was producing a sound between wailing and growling. Strange indeed. Yet, we still couldn't tell from exactly where or what the signal was coming from. We had to get closer. A week later, while planning out safety precautions about getting within orbiting range of planet ISO, I noticed communication back to the IEA seemed unusually quiet. Throughout this entire trip, they usually check back in with us every few days for us to give them an update on our travels. Everyone had been so focused on our anticipated arrival to planet ISO that no one had even noticed the uncharacteristic silence of the communication center. 
I attempted to contact them at first to see if everything was clear and to tell them what the following days would bring us. I received no response. I tried a few more times, all yielding the same outcome. No response. I checked back through the communications history logs to see when the last time there was any contact between our vessel and the IEA. The last time any contact had been made was over a week ago. This was disconcerting, and although cuts in communications were not uncommon, gaps in communication lasted for at most only a few days. I alerted my crewmates and decided to have a more in-depth look at the rest of our systems. First, I triple-checked our navigational systems. Everything seemed fine. I could still triangulate our position relative to the beacons we left before the drop-off, and we were exactly where we were supposed to be. It was only when I got to our steering programs that I started to detect that things weren't working properly. Part of our software controlling the ship's power and control was shut down or severely damaged. This was something that actually worried me. The results of this could mean a number of things. And although we still had time to fix the problem, it could potentially mean we would lose a lot of control over how fast and in what direction the ship was moving. After our engineers spent hours analyzing over both the complications, it was determined that around two weeks ago, a force of some sort had corrupted several of the ship's systems. It was also found in the investigation that many other functions were offline, such as refrigeration in some parts of the ship, alien body detection, and even lighting in the lower hallways. Seeming random things that were online days ago were now broken. Even though our engineers were unsure of exactly what caused this, they determined that some sort of impulse had started taking effect on our vessel around two weeks ago and had slowly been eroding our electronic systems ever since then, which meant that it was most likely still damaging our ship as we spoke. The entirety of the crew worked furiously in the weeks preceding our arrival to the orbiting zone, but no matter how hard we tried, it seemed like no solution could be found. A few days before we began orbiting, the lights were noticeably dimmer in the hallways and it began taking longer and longer for our phones to charge. Even with seemingly everything slowly shutting down for no reason, our steering and acceleration still seemed to be mostly functional. So although uneasy, I still felt we could go through with the orbit. Approximately seven years and four months after we departed, me and the rest of the navigational team managed to pull the ship into orbit around planet ISO. Our celebration was amazing and full of good times, but was also overshadowed by a lingering feeling that was loitering in the back of our minds. Would our power cut out completely? Not only would we not be able to get back, light to grow our food, filter our water, and other vital necessities would all be in shortage. On top of that, the signal was louder than ever. And although still unintelligible, a cacophony of horrible, low-pitched waves was the only thing discernible through the deafening static. The next step of our plan was to determine if it would be safe to set up a station down on the barren sands of planet ISO. Nothing about what I heard in the signal made me feel relaxed, as well as our ship was mysteriously losing power. But nevertheless, it was decided that no substantial threat could be detected and that we were to start setting up in a few days if we still couldn't find any reason not to. The landers were prepped for departure, and we loaded as much supplies as we could in each of them. We didn't want to have to make any trips back up, as that would have been a huge waste of fuel and time. About 75% of the crew would come down with us, and the remaining would stay behind on the ship, including the Ducibus. After landing, we were told to remain in the cockpit with the engine still running in case any unexpected hazards came into our sights. Once we were cleared, we were then to start setting up our small research tent. From our vessel, we determined there was no atmosphere. This would mean we would have to set up a pressurized tent so we were able to breathe, communicate, and work without a suit on the whole time. With no atmosphere detected, it meant that if there was some sort of life on this planet, it most likely did not need oxygen to survive. I suited up, along with Baxter and the rest of the crew that was landing on planet ISO with me. Everything was prepped for departure. The original plan was to stay down on the planet for a month 
and then dock back up with the ship for our return home. Of course, we would also have to be quarantined and surveyed extensively once we got back on the ship, in case we brought back any sort of life with us. As I was entering the cockpit, I heard one of the engineers that was standing behind mention something about how the dessert bar had completely lost power. Things like that made me second guess this entire excursion. Then again, it didn't really matter what I thought. We were too far into this mission to turn back anyway. Still, I wondered if the docks for our landers would even work when we tried to return back to the ship. Our lander, along with the rest, touched down in a vast plain of ground covered in a thin layer of white dust. No craters anywhere near us, which was unfortunate, because we needed to get rock samples from there. Off in the distance, there was an enormous mountain range that created a surreal vista in contrast with the black void that was above it. After we got the all clear from the mothership, we immediately got to work on setting up the pressurized tent. Day one of our stay mostly consisted of setting up the tent, making sure our food, water, and oxygen supplies were set up, and carefully assembling research equipment within the tent. Day two was when we really got to work. The first samples of rock we recovered and studied under a microscope. The gravitational properties were recorded. The rover was assembled. Day three, even more research was done. Heat readings were taken. Insects back from Earth were brought out and studied. I was tasked with collecting more rock samples with Baxter from the closest crater we could find and mapping out our way there. For ten days, this is how our time was spent mapping out more of the planet, collecting samples, and even searching for the source of the signal, which we had found no sign of. I found it extremely odd that we hadn't found anything that could explain the frequency yet. The team was going to start drilling soon, after our tenth day. On the eleventh day, I was tasked with mapping my way to the mountain range. Normally, Baxter came with me on all my trips, as it was standard safety protocol, and I enjoyed his company. However, today he was busy with some other work back at the tent, so I decided just to go on my own. It was a slight breach of protocol, but no one really cared at this point. The mothership estimated the distance between our tent and the start of the mountain range to be around 20 miles. I would be back before everyone even started to wind down for the day. That's something else I forgot to mention. Because of the way the planet rotates around the star, there is almost no darkness here on our side of planet ISO, excluding the depths of craters. Anyway, knowing that, I knew finding my way back to the tent wouldn't be a problem given I mapped my way to the mountains as best I could. I couldn't tell you how much I wish I would have brought Baxter with me. At approximately 5 in the afternoon, after around an hour of slowly finding my way through the hills leading up to the range, I received a communication request on the dash of my rover. I stopped and put it in park. Whatever it was, I knew it couldn't be good, as this was completely off schedule from when we normally received our check-ins. Furthermore, the screen of my rover told me the communications request was coming straight from a member of the Deucibus. I sat there for several seconds my body all of a sudden aching with dull pain as panic started to rise up in me. I answered the call and was immediately met with the frantic voice of Morgan, who is indeed an older member of the Deucibus. He warned me that something went wrong back at the touchdown site and to not return until further notice. The radio signal cut off for a few seconds, leaving me in alienating silence until Morgan started communication back up again. We aren't exactly sure what's happening. All we know is that Five minutes ago, we received a signal from the tent, and upon picking up, could make out the sound of horrible gurgling, along with faint shrieks in the background. Then we heard more commotion for a few more seconds until it went completely silent. Did the transmission cut out? No. In fact, the transmission is technically still putting out a signal. It's just dead quiet. We have no idea what the fuck this means, but we are currently too far away to get a good view of the site, so we don't know much more than I just told you. Now I felt afraid. I was about to ask what I should do next, but Morgan cut in again. Try to make your way as far away from the tent site as you can. If you're able to stay in between the divots of the hills, even better. We're working on sending a lander your way shortly. 
You should have enough oxygen in your rover to survive around a week. And if you follow protocol, you should also have plenty of food and water. It might be a good day or two until we can get the lander down to you. Just make sure that once you get a little further from the tent site, to stay as hidden as possible. Also, try not to put off any more signals of any kind until we contact you again. Shortly before shit started happening, your crewmates told us you were experimenting with different radio signals back at the tent. Trying to see what would happen, I guess. We think this might be involved in what's happening. We will contact you as soon as possible to update you further. Before I could say anything else and demand to know what else they knew, the signal cut out, and I was plunged back into uncomfortable silence. That was the last time I ever received communication from them again. I tried hard not to let panic set in. My eyes were wide with fear as I tried to even believe what Morgan had just told me. Luckily, I had followed protocol, and if I rationed, I could probably make it another two weeks in this rover before things would, well, start to go downhill. I did what I was told and stayed low as I made my way further and further from the research area. For a few days, time morphed into one continuous indiscernible strand. No one that hasn't lived on a planet with no night would understand. But it was impossible to tell how much time went by, except by looking at my wristwatch. For days I would climb the nearest hill and peek over and try to see anything only for a vast expanse of cold and quiet landscape to peer back at me. I almost felt like I was in limbo, and there was no atmosphere on this planet. Nothing made any noise outside my nervous breathing, and nothing swayed in the wind as I awaited my rescue. On my third day of hiding, I looked up to see my mother ship that had been orbiting above me since we landed. The flare of an engine starting made me get out of the rover and send sparks of hope shooting through my mind. It looked as if they finally had sent a lander to retrieve me, so I could get the hell off this place. They never notified me, informing me that they were coming, nor did they respond to my call when I tried radioing them shortly after I noticed they had launched a lander. All I could do was watch the hawk of metal slowly drift closer and closer to where I stood. As the lander approached the surface of planet ISO, I expected the ship to orient itself and turn on its rockets so it could land without damaging itself. But as I gazed on, no action on board was ever taken, and it started drifting dangerously close to the ground. About fifty feet away, the side of the ship scraped into the ground, stripping long flaps of metal off the side. The rest of the ship barged straight into a nearby hill, with a silent eruption of metal and debris shooting away from its impact. I just stared at the wreck, shocked. Without looking away, I radioed the mothership against the advice Morgan had given me days prior. The lander just crashed into the ground, I said. It unnerved me how casually I spoke into the receiver. No response. I needed to get back up to the ship if I wanted to have any chance of living. So I tried again, and once more, I was met with silence. I circled around the back of my rover and retrieved the optical mapping tools we kept in order to help us document the area around us on expeditions. I really shouldn't have even looked. It was obvious something was very, very wrong. But I did anyway. I pointed the telescope straight back to the main ship, still orbiting above me. I couldn't make out any details of what was actually inside the ship, but I could tell, even with a low-powered telescope that no lights were on. Most damning of all, however, was the bay door that separated the interior of the ship from the vacuum of space it was wide open. This bay door led from the interior of the ship to where the lander that just crashed feet away from me took off from. I didn't know if there was an accident when they launched the lander to come rescue me or if something much more unnatural happened before liftoff. All I knew is that it was most likely everyone on the ship was dead. I took what little I could from the lander, which was really just a few spare tanks of air mixture and some dried food. I tried to avoid looking at the unrecognizable mass of red meat that was strewn between the tangle of metal that lay on the ground. From there, 
I only had one last option that could bring me salvation. I could go back to the tent site and use my lander to fly myself back to the ship without anyone else on board to help me. It would be next to impossible to dock with the mothership, especially without running the real risk of crashing straight into it. However, I could get myself close enough to use my jetpack to fly into the open compartment left by the lander that just recently attempted to save me. Sounds like a long shot, I know, and it was. But when it's either that or dying on a planet millions of miles away from home, you take whatever chances are given to you. Hold on, something's wrong with my transmitter. I'll send the rest of my story as fast as I can. <laughs>